For decades, solar energy was considered an energy source that had the potential to help save the planet. Yet it remained stagnant. But when five friends with electrical engineering and R&D experience identified what was holding solar back, they set out to solve this challenge. This is how they developed an inverter and power optimizer solution that changed the way power is harvested and managed in solar energy systems. And that's how Solar Edge was founded in 2006. Within only a few years, Solar Edge had become an award-winning inverter company that was ranked among the global top 10. And less than 10 years after its founding, the company went public on the NASDAQ. Committed to engineering excellence and with a problem-solving culture, Solar Edge remained on a fast trajectory focused on solving some of the most difficult energy challenges of our world. It is this determination that motivates each of our employees every day and leads us to invest heavily in R&D. Because of this, over the past few years, the company has continued to launch breakthrough technologies that contribute to the advancement of the entire PV market. At the same time that we've introduced multiple innovations, we've been growing and expanding. Today, we are the world's number one solar inverter company. We have over 2,000 employees in 26 countries around the world a growing number of R&D centers and manufacturing facilities, and installations in 133 countries. But we are just powering up. After spending the past 10 years advancing the solar industry, we have set our sights on doing the same for the energy industry as a whole. We've started expanding into new businesses, including UPS, battery, and EV powertrain companies. By synergistically combining our core expertise with these complementary energy technologies, Solar Edge has the key building blocks to develop smart solar energy ecosystems that power our lives, our buildings, our cars, and our cities. At our core, we believe that a continuous improvement in the ways we produce and consume energy will lead to a better future for us all. Amazing. Simply amazing. Just one of those other videos that we've released from our marketing team and showing where Solar Edge has come from, where Solar Edge is going, and as how we as an industry are changing the future. So Solar Edge is, is powering the future, and it's really evident for those of you that were at the, the Solar and Storage show this week as well, to actually see all the, the innovation and the products which are all coming from Solar Edge to make this transition happen well for you as installers and also for your homeowners as well. So welcome to today, uh, today's webinar, which is quite sadly for me, actually the last in our session. This is the designer level four session. And we are once again here on a Friday at one o'clock and this is a live session. So thank you very much for attending today. Sorry about my voice. Um, as you can just imagine how much I talk on here. Just imagine how much it is talking for three days and three nights as well. So welcome today to level four, our expert training. Um, this is the fourth in our series of our webinars, uh, which we've been running this month um, throughout the month of November. So thanks once again for everyone that's attending and thanks for all the feedback that you've been sending over. And it's, it's really nice to hear the feedback from people over the last three days at the Solar and Storage Show, um, bringing benefits to you and making everything nice and easy for you as well. So my name is Richard Fuel, UK and Irish sales manager. Uh, contact details are there as, as I always show and also once again we're joined by Chris Laver who is our commercial project manager. Just coming back to that video there showing about how many um, employees we've got uh, over 2,000 we've actually we've actually nearly doubled that and Chris being one of those and from a personal point of view as well I, I, I know that you're listening Chris and uh, I just want to say that you're an absolute asset to our to our company uh, you're an absolute asset to the designer and everything that you do on these sessions it really does bring so much value to uh, to us as a company so so thank you chris and all the feedback that i've had from people over the last three days as well so you you are very very much appreciated for everything that you're doing 
So here we are on the designer webinar sessions. Uh, so this, as I've mentioned, is the level four, which is the expert. So we've got the four designer sessions. Um, and for those of you that may have missed those, don't worry too much because I've actually prepared an email already with all of the recordings. So after this session, I'm not gonna wait till Monday. As soon as the recording's ready, I'm just gonna send the email out to everyone that's attended uh, today. So you can um, uh, receive that straight away in there as well. So there we go. Um, I'm just gonna write over in the chat box as well. Um, just if you've got any questions throughout the session, this is where you can, uh, that's where you can ask them. So I've just already prepared that there as well. Um, and then just as, uh, as, as a brief reminder, you need to be using Google Chrome. You need to be using a mouse. Um, I was actually with someone on Tuesday this week where they had a, a, a touch screen, which is quite nice to use as well. Um, but you obviously need to use a mouse. So you can't really use an iPad without a mouse. Um, and then to focus on your angles throughout the whole session. So as always, I'm just going to flip straight over to the Solar Edge uh, website straight away. Um, and you may have actually seen some announcements and uh, the batteries, the Solar Edge batteries, the energy bank, they've started to land now into the country. Uh, we're going to get some more arriving in December and then hundreds of the units are going to be arriving in January. The one thing that you need to let your electricians know, your installation teams, is that they have to carry out the Solar Edge energy bank training. In order to purchase the battery, you need to be taking out the energy bank training and the energy bank training can be found in under login and just here on the Edge Academy. Okay, so for those of you, sign in there and then carry out the energy bank training in there. Okay, so I'm just gonna flip straight over to designer. And um, today what we're gonna be doing is an expert designer session. Um, but before, and I'll just go over the details of what we're going to be going over today. But before I do, for some of them, uh, some of you people that uh, perhaps don't know about this, we have covered this before. But if you've started the project, if you've created the project, once you've typed in the postcode and put your red pointer onto the location, once you've pressed create, it's stored, it's saved, and it's there, and it will be in your list. If you ever get to the stage where you're struggling with a design, both myself and Chris are here to help you. Um, and so if there's certain aspects or you can't move the modules, or you've got any issues with that, if you've created it, you can very easily share that project with us so that we can amend it and make it to how you want it to be. So once you've created it and it's in your list, once you hover above it on the main project page, you can see just here, share. Once you click on share, it then opens up this page here. So we're not a customer, so you need to share it with us that we are a user. So right here, click share with users. And then right here, you can change here, change to can edit. That means that we can actually change it. If you just share it with us as can view, we can see it, but we can't actually do anything on the project. Once you've done that, type in the email address. So chris.laver at solaredge.com, as you can see there, solaredge.com. And then once you've done that, just press plus, okay? Once you press plus, the name will then appear in there, and then we can see it in our account. Finally, the last thing is just click here where it says copy project link. That's much like saying copy and paste, uh, oh, sorry, as in control C for copy, and just drop us an email. Dear Chris, I'm really struggling with this design. Can you help me? Paste. And then from that, we then just get the URL. We can click on that and then easily access that project for you. Frequently, what I do have is where someone says, I've shared a project with you. Great, I don't know what it's called. I don't know where it is. Um, have you actually shared it with me that I can edit? And what am I doing? So just a brief email with the link in there, and that helps immensely. Excuse me. So today what we're going to be doing is we're actually going to be showing you some trees. We're going to be showing you the, the shading impact that trees can have, uh, show you how to draw trees, the height of trees, uh, different types of trees, uh, if they're tall and thin or if they're fat and small, uh, all of these different systems that you can actually have on there. Um, we're also going to be showing you a curved roof. Um, so for a Calzit roof or a commercial property, um, indeed as well, this can work on a, a smaller scale roof if it's curved or anything like that. We're also going to be showing you a carport design as well. So there's a lot of interesting carports at the moment from uh, public sector, uh, from councils and other large corporate companies. So we're going to show you how to do a carport. And then what I'm actually going to start with uh, is uh, the financials. So we have the financials tab, which we've not covered so far in this series, and just show you how you can actually put the, the price of the system in there and then a payback in there as well. So this is a project that I've got just here. And this is the expert designer, which I've already created. Before we do any of that, I'm just going to show you a couple of things that seem to come up quite often. So what we've got here is we've actually got a project with lots of different roofs, and we've got a, an owner of a property that actually owns this building and this building here as well. So what he wants to do is he wants to put the solar on these two buildings. So we come to the site modeling on the left-hand side, and you can see here I've drawn this building and I've drawn this building. 
I've also drawn this building here as well because we can see that there's an impact of shading and it actually is this building slightly higher. So if I come up to 3D in the top right hand corner, you can see here when I zoom in, I've actually made that building slightly higher as well. So we can actually see that the impact of the shading is going to have on this property. If I then come into the PV modules. Oh, no, sorry. No, that's right. Yep. So I click on the roof. I've already designed the roof. I've got my meter boundary from the outside. Click onto the add PV panels. And here I've, I've chosen the Hanwha Q-Cell 340 watt modules. And I'm just going to then drag over the top and put these panels into position like so. Then I press entire side once again, and this roof here as well. <clears throat> Click onto that one. Again on this one, add the panels, same panels, the QCL 340s. Drag over the top. And I'm just gonna come down something like that and put those into position. So if I then go to entire site, and there's my design. Very, very nice. Okay, that's all good there. I've got some shading impact as you can see, <clears throat> only from the Google Earth image. But if I then click on the irradiance, you can then actually see the impact as well from the irradiance that's going to be caused on these panels. So it depends what you want to do if you're maximizing the roof space that's available. Obviously, if these panels are shaded, it won't be affecting the performance of these panels over here. Um, because what, what we're doing is obviously optimizing every panel. So from this, if these panels are shaded, it won't be affecting the rest of the system. So it depends what you want to do by actually maximizing the roof space. But then come down to the electrical design. And here we are, suggesting to me a 33 kilowatt inverter. I simply click on auto stringing nice and easy, and then press generate. And that's it. <clears throat> I've now got my system, which is designed. The problem I've got here is I've actually got two buildings, and you can see that it's actually joining the two roofs together. And my customer, and as my electrician as well, he wants to have them two separate. So what I've got here is it's joined the two together, and how can I now change this nice and easily um, by adapting the design so I have one inverter for this roof and one inverter for this roof. So what I need to actually do is just take a couple of steps back on this. I'm just going to press undo. I'm just going to come back to the PV modules. What I'm going to do this time, so I'm going to click on this roof here. I'm just going to press delete. So now when I come in, I've got my design here with this roof of the solar modules, but I haven't got the solar modules on this side. You can come back to the electrical design. And now you can see it's suggesting a 25 kilowatt inverter. Press auto stringing. Let's generate. And then from this, you can now see I've got my one inverter and I've got my optimizers and my modules on this uh, particular roof just here. Let's move my inverter down so that's there. Then I simply go back to the PV modules, click on the next roof, just take a radiance away, and then add my panels. Simply drag those over the top like that. It's great. And come back to the entire site. And now I'm back to where I was before. If I come to the electrical design, got one inverter for this side and now I don't have that connected to this one here. So because I haven't got an inverter associated to this roof, what I now need to do is just simply add another inverter. Do this just here on the add inverter tab. Click on that one and now you can see I've already got my 25k inverter and now it's suggesting a 16k inverter on there as well. Okay and then press auto stringing, that's my stringing and press to generate and that's it all good. So now I've got my two inverters. The problem that we've got here now, though, is you can see it's not actually strung these panels. Now, the reason for this is because we've got too many panels for one string, but we don't have enough panels for two strings. So a couple of this, this does come up quite often and essentially you're falling right between the chairs because you don't have enough power for two strings. Like I said, and you, you've got too much for one string. So one of the ways you can get over this is uh, if you click on the inverter in particular, <coughs> excuse me, um, and what we can do is just up here, we can click on the optimizers, and then here we can then select the P401. Now we've got the optimizers uh, as doubles, but my string is now going to be as a single P401 optimizer. I can then manually string these along, and you can see it's still red because I don't have enough optimizers in the circuit. If I continue along, I think it's a stage where I have enough optimizers in my string. And now I've got the string of the dual optimizers and a string of the single optimizers as well. This then completes this into a 16 kilowatt inverter. OK, so there's that's, that's one option of what you can do. So then you've got two strings, you've filled all the modules, everything's in there, it's complete. Something else just to bring your attention to. 
I'll just come undo once again. Undo. If I come back to the electrical design, if I add an inverter, sometimes if it suggests to you a 15 kilowatt inverter, which we don't actually make anymore anyway, but if we have a 15 kilowatt inverter, you can see it's superseded. This one here will automatically select the P401 optimizers. The reason why it's going to do that is because it's, it, it doesn't work with the dual optimizers. Dual optimizers only work with the 17 kilowatt and higher inverter. So you can always change the inverter that you want to use. And don't forget, you've got the oversizing at the top that you can allow that to happen as well. OK, I just reminded myself that it's pointless talking about that because we don't actually have the 15 kilowatt anyway. So one of the other things that you can do with this is rather than having a string of uh, single optimizers and a string of joules, is actually changing the optimizers in that circuit. So if I click on the inverter in particular, what I can do here I just actually press undo, add inverter, and over here I've got a 16K inverter, and it's suggesting to me the P701s. Now, for those of you that know SolarEdge, you'll know that we have a data sheet, and you'll know that we've got different optimizers, uh, whether it's a P701, a P730, a P850, a P950, and they've all got their own unique characteristics. With those characteristics, it can be down to the amount of power that's allowed on the string or up to the amount of voltage that's allowed and things like that. So in this situation, the first thing that I personally would do is actually change my power optimizer to a different power optimizer in that circuit. So if I just press delete, I just change this to a P850, for example, and now do the auto stringing. What you can see now is I've actually got the same situation as before where I don't have enough optimizers, uh, sorry, I have too many panels in this circuit to complete that as one string. So a couple of situations of what you could do is simply uh, remove the three panels. So then you actually have that as one string and then you've got the 24 optimizers in the circuit or perhaps change it to a different power optimizer and just see if that actually works within the system. But this, this really is a site where it actually falls completely through the chairs where you can't actually get all of those modules onto, um, a, uh, onto dual optimizers. So it's when you're in the, in the inverter selection and the optimizer design, that's just how you can change those different things. So what I'm going to do now is just move on to the financials. If I come back to the, the, the project info at the very beginning, now from last week, we showed you how to actually have the, uh, the uploaded the half hourly data. Um, so with that, you can upload the half hourly data to give you a more accurate understanding. You can see here, I've actually got the energy bill here from the customer, and he said that he's got, uh, he doesn't have the half hourly data, but he said he's got 77,000 kilowatt hours. And we've chosen commercial shopping hours for the custom profile. Once you've put this in there and you've pressed apply, come down to the financials. Now the financials can be the same for residential, for commercial, anything like that. Once you come into the, uh, the financial section, this is what opens. The financial parameters at the top is something which is a standard and you can change this if you'd like to. There's certain things you can add in there if you want to add in a, a cost of an inverter replacement, um, or if you want to add in some um, uh, maintenance costs in there, annual maintenance costs. Uh, the inverter lifetime, so that's down to our warranty of 12 years. Uh, the system lifetime, this then comes onto the summary report of what you want to show your customer. If it's for 20 years, if it's for 25 years, or anything like that, you can actually then change these simulations. But this is as it comes out standard with this thing. Top right hand corner, we've got the uh, degradation of the modules as well. So as an average is 0.4%. This could be higher, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 1%. Depends on the data sheet of the module and the degradation of their performance. Here as well, we've got the expected energy price increase. So this is standard is 2%. Don't forget this is a global uh, um, system. This is a global designer which is used around. If you know or if you've got evidence or, or anything like that and you're speaking to your client about the expected energy price increase, then you can change this in here by typing in say 4% or 8% or whatever. But this will make a calculation for what you're doing over the next 20 years. So it's quite difficult to actually explain this to, uh, um, to or, or put in as a standard. There's, there's no set increase. You know, I don't know what the price of energy is going to be in 10 years time or 15 years time or even three years time. You know, with the uh, energy price increases which have happened recently, perhaps 2% is actually um, quite a bit lower than what it should be. So perhaps change that to 4%, but I don't know. Once we come down, sorry, just to go back. Essentially, there's nothing up here that you really need to change, but that is how you can change it, and that's for the simulation. 
If you scroll down slightly, we've then got the energy consumption, which we've already typed in. So we've got 77,841 with the commercial shopping hours, which we chose as the profile. This section here is when you need to put in your price. So this is how much you're going to charge this customer for their system. So if I come on here and let's say, for example, I'm charging the customer £40,000 for this installation or 30,000 pound or 35 or 50, whatever, that's down to you. Then here we've got our bill of materials. So we've uh, we've got the option here of a 16K, uh, the 25K, the P850s and the P701s as we had before. And then just at the top, in fact, that is a mistake. I need to go back to the modules because it's not going to show correctly. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry about this. Just change that up there to the P401 and then just click on the string. like that let's go 17 back to my financials okay so the fixed the fixed price that's the price that you're going to charge the customer you do have the option in here as well if you want to do price per what or price according to the bill of materials and if you did the price of the bill of materials then in here you can then put the prices of the different things that are in here uh, you can add different things in there as well a couple of people have asked about this to actually be included on the summary page you can do it when I say about this and people have asked, it's like, can we put the price of mounting systems, of isolators, uh, of, of, of different aspects? You can do that in here, add a custom item. And then for example, you can put in there uh, electrical items, click that in there. There's your price in there. Let's say it's, I don't know, 400 pounds. Press enter and then it adds it up. So you can change the different prices of the system. You can change the price of the power optimizer. You can do that as you want. Generally speaking though, what I would do is I would always go for the fixed price because then it's nice and clear it's forty thousand pounds oh enter oh that's forty thousand okay and this is the bit once uh, it comes into let's just get rid of that this is the bit down here which is the section that perhaps you haven't done it before so you won't see these because i've done this multiple times when i click on the utility provider i've got a lot of different utility providers where i've done with different tests um, so there's an octopus test there I've done, an EON test, an EDF, SSE, all of these different things. So when you first click on it, you're going to see this here that says, uh, you may see EDF test actually, but right here you're going to see can't find your rate. So once you click on can't find your rate, it then opens up a new window. Now you can make as many different rates as you want to do. So for this one here, you simply type in the utility provider. So say for example, we're going to do British gas, type in British gas, or if you're doing Total Energies or Bulb or Eon Next or anyone like that. You can just type those as a utility provider. Just give it a name. So you can give this the fixed May 2022 or the April 2024 or anything like that. It depends on how many rates you want to actually have. For ease of things, what I'm going to do is just type in a rate. So I'm just going to call it 18.5p. This one here, you have to type in the export rate. So for the export rate, just click on fixed rate. And then this would then be say 0 0.04 or 0 0.045. Depends on how much power the energy company or the MCS or whatever they're paying you for a standard export guarantee of the power that's going out to the grid. So that's your export rate. Top right hand corner, we've then got a couple of other things that we need to fill in. So a fixed charge, this would be the standing charge of say 30 pence. Minimum charge, again, so that's gonna be the standard charge of say 30 pence. You can type in this start dates, effective dates. Depends how, how much detail you wanna go into it. Scroll down here, and then here is the fixed rate. So this is where we're going to type in the rate. So we've called it 18.5p. We're just going to then type 18.5p. I'll come back to this in a second. We then press done. Failed to connect to server. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Our unit name already exists. Okay, let's call it 18.6. 18.6. Let's press done. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Okay. I'll do this bit now then. <laughs> so this is a fixed rate. So this is if uh, if a customer is paying obviously a flat rate, um, if they're buying power at 2 a.m. in the morning, 4 a.m., 6 o'clock, whatever, that's a fixed rate of 18.6p. So those people that are out there that have the old style economy seven, or perhaps they've got different tariffs where they've got uh, different prices, perhaps at the weekend, evenings, anything like that. What we can do just here is click on a charge structure or time of use. If we select this one here, it then gives us this option just below. And you can see here, it's quite complicated, but it's really quite easy to use. So here we've got the months of the year. So January, February, all the way down to December. 
And then here we've then got the timeline across there as well. So say for example, overnight or, or a certain tariff, they're only paying say nine pence. So we type in 0.9. There are 0.9. Then what we do is when we move our mouse over here now, well, that is all of the nine p's. Okay. If we then have a different period, so during the day they've actually paying 17 p. We then simply click add period. Now the new period here is then when we'd send in um, 0.16. In fact, that should be 0.09. Okay. So now we've got a, a, a number two, and this is the the um, 16 p. So right here, when I move over, you can actually see I've now got a paintbrush. So if I come over, say, between six o'clock, and I then just drag this over the top by holding down my left button, and then say all the way through to, say, 6 p.m., so for a 12-hour period, I then just simply come down, still holding down my left button, come down to December, and then release. Now what it's doing is it's at, at, between these times here, I'm actually paying 9 pence, but between these times here, I'm paying 16p. That's the weekdays, obviously. Weekends, perhaps there's another charge. Perhaps over the weekend, it's uh, a flat rate of, say, I don't know, 0.05p, for example. That'd be nice. And then from this, we could do this over the weekend. So now we can say 24 hours a day, every Saturday and Sunday, we have got this flat rate charge. So then you can actually build this and actually make this to how you want it to be. Okay, so that's, that's that. Did I get them all? Can't move over. That's that. So that's, that's, that's the different ones if you've got a different rate of tariff. And then, because I've got this as a fixed charge, I just want to see if this one is there. I'm just going to type in a flexible rate. Flexible rate 9 and 16. Press done. Okay, so that is how you would uh, set that up. Apologies, I don't know why it's uh, come up with this bug. But anyway, that's that. So once you press done, it would then press done. It's done. Everything's great. Oh, again, I've got another fix. How's that? Oh, I've already created it. Press cancel. Confirm. So now when I come onto my utility rate, that one would now appear. And I think that one likely has actually appeared now. But it hasn't. No, there it is. Flexible rate 9 and 10. So that's the one that we've just chosen. We click on that section there. And we can then always check ourselves by coming onto the rate overview. That gives us an understanding. That's it. It's really nice and simple. Once you've actually created one rate, you can use it time and time and time again. If the rates increase, then you can then change the rates, new rates. It's down to you. If you want to create just one, create one. If you want to create 10, create 10. It's down to you. You can create as many as you want. Then when we come then down to the summary page, so here's our two designs, our two different roofs. Got our logo on there. We can then print this out, save it as a PDF, print it onto a piece of paper those different things as we scroll down you can see we've got our, our, our system installed of 39 kilowatts maximum cheese of 36 and we've then got the annual energy of almost 40 megawatt hours co2 savings just over nine ton so we can see here from the consumption from our profile of the generation of nearly 40 megawatt hours self-consuming nearly 40 74 percent and of the 77 megawatt hours that they're using we're going to be self-consuming uh, 38%, and that's again based on our profile that we put in there in the first place. Half hourly data would obviously be a lot more accurate. And then as we come down, got a bill of materials as we have before. Keep coming down, system loss diagram, simulation parameters. As we come down, we've now got our financial overview. So this is the price that we're uh, that obviously we're, that they're going to pay for. So it's 40,000 pounds. It's then calculating the lifetime bill savings. This is taking into account all of those simulation parameters in the first place. So it's an IRR of 12% uh, and we've got a payback period there of 8.2 years. So the current energy bill of what they're paying, which is based on what we've said their price is, and then the new bill, once they actually have it with Solar Edge, is then reduced down to that. So we're actually offsetting that bill by almost 50% of the power. This is where we haven't put any maintenance costs in. You may remember from the simulation result, didn't change anything there. Uh, if there's any incentives, Obviously, there's no incentives here in the UK, but for those of you over in different regions, perhaps in Ireland or something, you can add different incentives in there. And then we've got a nice cash flow in here as well, a nice graph to actually show to the client that this is the presenting of what the system's going to generate, what the system's actually going to cost, and what the payback period is going to be on there as well. And then it gives you a really nice yearly cash flow uh, of this system price to begin with of uh, 40,000 pounds, and then the net savings and the annual cash flow all the way down through. So maybe for a financial director or something like that. 
Now, if I do go to the print up here, it's going to print everything that you've just seen. So all of these different sections in there. Now, perhaps what you actually want to have at the very top of your quote is you want to have the detailed financial analysis with the payback period and the different things. Over here on the right hand side, you can actually see this is in a section. So we've got a section here and then we've got another section here. So if perhaps what I want to do is have the financial overview at the very top, I just click on the arrow and I can take it all the way to the very top. So now when you print off your report at the very top, you've got your system design, you've got the price on there, you've got the payback period straight away. Some people may want to put it at the top, in the middle, down the bottom, down to you. Again, likewise, if there's something down here, you want this nice pretty graph to come to the top. Again, you can then just bring this to the very top. And then you can see once that's at the top, you've then got those different things in there. Because we've got this one at the top with the financial overview, perhaps we don't actually want to have the detailed finance one, perhaps we don't want this one. We can then just press X, get rid of it. So then from that, this is at the very top and you can customize your whole summary page on the way that you want it to be presented to your customer. Likewise, if you then come up to the print, so I'm just going to show you what this looks like on the save as a PDF. So up here, I've got it save as PDF. I've got my image there, which looks like I've got a bug. Oh no, that's because I haven't got the other images. And perhaps this is because it's too big to actually fit in that page. So personally, rather than just printing this or saving it as PDF, I would make it look to the way that I want it to be. So as you come down, you can see it's got everything in there. So you can customize it and make it how you want it to be. Perhaps the simulation parameters, you don't want those to be in there. So just press cancel, scroll down to the simulation parameters just here. Don't want that, just press X. Okay. Richard, um, yes. someone's asked the question, once you've removed something from the summary, how Great. do you make it appear? How do you make You're it on page appear? Two, I'm on page one. Yes, fantastic. Okay, yeah. so just to answer that question, I've got here the report settings. So if I click on report settings, you can now see that my financial overview is now gone. Okay, so if I want it to come back, I can just click on uh, the tick box and then press apply, and then it's going to have come back in there. And there it is right there at the top, the financial overview. One of the best things about this as well, and thanks, Chris, because I wasn't going to talk about this bit, is once you've actually made it to the way you want it to be, and you've got that, and that's the standard that you're going to go forwards with, once you've pressed report settings and you've got that the way you want it to be, you can then set that as your default. So every new design that you carry out will be exactly as you've had it on day one. So, um, yeah, so perhaps you want the table view, the advanced, whatever. That's where you can basically disassemble, disassemble, uh, disable uh, or, or, or re-enable back in there. OK, and that's that set as default and apply. So now for me, every design I go forwards with is going to have that in that in that in that place and in that location. Um, and then finally, last thing as well, um, before um, I go over way over my time. Um, here I've got the project layout. So just here, when I click on the project layout, I can download this as a PDF. You see it then opens, click on the string and design. And now from this, again, I can print this out, top right hand corner, I've got a printer, save as PDF, print onto a piece of paper. And then I can provide this now to my installer, uh, my actual electrician, my actual roofing team, to show that I've got two strings here and I've got the, uh, the other strings over here. And in the top right hand corner, I've then got the uh, inverters uh, the 25 and the 16k inverter as well with all of those strings that are in there okay and then finally as well customers going ahead everything's great like the system want to go ahead that's the design same panels everything's the same and then finally just down in the bottom left hand corner we then click on export we click on export we then export this to the monitoring platform and once we've then exported that to the monitoring platform for those of you that haven't seen this very short video from my colleague Martin, um, and this is what you would see. Hi Rich, so you've completed your design on the designer, exported it to the portal. I've gone into the Mapper app and here's your site. I click on it, loads it onto my phone, and we'll see the layout you've just done. I'm choosing my starting point here. I hit QR code, starts up the camera, easy as that. So obviously that is just on a residential system, but it's so good. 
It really is. Once you've done all the hard work in designer, everything's going ahead. Great proposal. Love it. Brilliant. Let's go ahead. Click export to, uh, to monitoring and goes into the monitoring. Your installer can then log in on their mapper app, which is downloadable from Google Play or from the iTunes store. Uh, and then from that, click on the site. And as you've just seen, you then just scan the optimizers. That then creates all of the optimizers, the location of the site, uh, and everything's then all completed as well. And then finally on that, there's an icon on there of the, uh, the, uh, the, the inverter as well, uh, which we've got just here. So as you can see, these are the inverters. So that's how the layout would actually show on there as well. So this was the inverter for this one. So what I want to do just before I do any of that is just click on select. I just want to move this inverter down to this area just here. Move this one just here. So then when the guys are actually using the mapper, again, they can click on the inverter and scan the QR code of the inverter. Then the whole site's then created. You've done all the hard work. You've done it in designer. Everything's brilliant. And then from that, and then simply go straight into the monitoring. So that's it from me, Chris. That's it. It's over to you, mate. Thank you, Richard. I'll just take control of the screen here. Can you see my designer? Can you hear me? I can see you and I can hear you. And thanks very much, Chris, once again. Um, sorry for going over five minutes, mate. <laughs> good no time. worries. Um, good afternoon, Edgeteers. Uh, we've got a fair amount of development to do in a short space of time. Um, so we'll jump straight into it. Um, we're going to look at a curved roof today. Um, I believe the roof is cowzip, um, but you can also have curved roofs that are trapezoidal or other coverings for that matter. Um, so I'm going to drop my pin on this building um, and I'm going to zoom out a little bit. And before I hit anything else, um, I'm going to grab this little yellow person um, and drop them by the building. So here we can see the building we're looking to model. We can get nice and close to the curve. It's fairly shallow. Um, it's not particularly steep in gradient. Um, and I know you're all familiar with the street view, but essentially wherever a street view is available, um, we can get a look at the roof. Um, indeed, we can go down the other side as well. We can see some trees here, so we can start to incorporate these in our design also. Um, we will probably pretend the trees are a little bit taller um, just to simulate more shading, because I think if we look from this end, yeah, there's not many apart from this one and this one maybe that are actually at roof level, um, but we'll bring them up past the roof so you can see that on the irradiance feature um, in module placement. Um, but this essentially enables a recce of the building if you've not been to site, or indeed even if, even if you have been to site. Um, it's good practice um, to get familiar with the building um, by using this street view feature. Um, and once you're happy with it, you simply click this back button and it brings you back to the original view. Um, so I'm happy with my, where my red pin is and I'm going to create the project. So with a curved roof, um, we're essentially going to do the same process early on. We're going to model the outside lines of the building. Um, we're still going to put a ridge line in as normal. Um, and then from there, it gets a little bit different. Um, let's just wait for this to boot up. Okay, cool. Um, I like to spin my model and have it nice and aligned with this top black section, but you don't need to do that. Um, it's just a force of habit of mine. Um, so I just take a couple of seconds where as much as possible, I just like to try and get it lined up. Um, so let's take a different view. Normally, uh, we just draw lines uh, to the image we're seeing. Um, let's say we've been to site. Um, let's say we've got some accurate measurements, insanely accurate perhaps. Um, so let's just draw one line. Let's use the longest edge of the building first, because remember the first line will dictate the angles and all the other lines that you draw after it. So let's terminate the line there. Now it's asking me to draw another line, but if you hit escape, it rel relinquishes you from further duty. Uh, so you can click on the line, and then chase the distance of that line. Um, so I've got 87.06. Um, let's be pedantic and say we've been to site and it's definitely 87.1. You just enter that in there by double clicking, hit enter, that line is now 87.1 meters in length. You can then hit your draw function, connect the polygon, come down and remember, as always, we're looking in this corner for the right angles. 
difficult to see on a white roof sometimes. Um, so I'll add it in um, and then perhaps switch to grid view for the next two lines. Let's terminate the line there. What have we got? We've got 24.07. But again, let's be pedantic. So we've been to site. I want to change the length. So let's change this to 24.12. And we can see it's actually still fairly close to the image we're seeing, um, which is fine. So now I'm going to switch to grid view because I don't need to see this image in order to complete the model. So it just enables me to see easier, not only the right angles, but also the lines as you run it. As it comes parallel with this line, they will both go dark green, like so. And you can also see in this corner, your right angle there. So you're just going to float that line across till you get the green dotted line. Sometimes you can go ever so slightly past and you'll get a white dotted line. Ignore the white dotted line, just bring your cursor back ever so slightly and you'll have a green dotted line to indicate you're parallel with this edge. Let's just complete the model. All dark green, connect the dots, click out the model, control and A. Sorry, mate. Delete that. Delete that. Move to my cursor. Click out the model, control and A, and it will display the angles in every corner. So obviously we've only drawn a rectangle, it's nothing exciting. Uh, but when you've got multiple lines and, and multiple buildings, it's good to keep checking your angles. Can't encourage that enough. Okay, let's switch back to satellite view. Um, let's add a ridge line as normal. And to do that, as always, we're going to hover over the model, find the center point indicated by the turquoise circle. And then we're going to run the line parallel to the turquoise circle at the other end. Okay, so we can see, switch back to grid view. 1206, 1206, 1206, 1206, 87.1 on all three horizontal lines. So we're good to start. And before we add anything else to this model, we need some foresight. Um, because of the curve, we're essentially now going to add multiple sections across this model um, to create sections that we can place our modules in. But in order to do that, we need to know what module we're using and how big that module is. So let's just click on any, any elevation add PV modules, um, I'm going to use this just because it's there, um, a JAR Solar uh, 340 um, or a JA Solar, as I was corrected the other day, um, view module specifications. Um, so the length for this module is 1689, 1.689 meters or 1689 millimeters, however you want to say it. So we know that our sections have to be bigger than this to be able to incorporate the modules within them. So let's give ourselves a fighting chance and we'll just go two meters for simplicity. So we can now come back out of this, back into site modeling. I'm gonna to go to draw. Now you can do this anywhere along this line, but I'm gonna use the center point just because it's a nice reference. And like before where we knew a length uh, or rather a newer dimension and we wanted to enter it, first of all, we need to terminate the line. Then we're gonna press escape then we're going to click the line, double click in here, and enter two meters. I've now got a two meter line. I'm now simply going to get rid of that background view because it's going to get confusing. I'm going to connect the line across, make sure it's dark green parallel, and do the same here. Then I can simply select these lines holding control, clicking one line in the other two lines, control and C on my keyboard. And now because it's quite tight within the model, I'm going to float my cursor outside of the model and hit Control and V. So I've noticed today, um, as you pay something in Designer, it doesn't hasn't highlighted everything. Normally when you pay something, you can just pick it up straight away and move it. So keep an eye for what's dark blue, because that means that's what's selected. So I'm simply going to draw a box over that by pressing the left mouse, mouse button, covering what I want to uh, move. And then I'm going to simply move that up. I know that polygon is going to connect there. And I can see these two have connected at the end. I'm going to repeat that one more time and hit Control and V because it's already on my clipboard. Highlight again and move this into position. Now, rather than doing it one by one, I'm going to select this line, this line, and these four lines here. Control and C. So I now have a new copy on the, copy on the clipboard. Control and V highlight everything, and move that into position. I'm then going to repeat the same process on the other side of the roof. 
So again, I'm going to hit draw, find the midpoint, come up, terminate the line, press escape, click on the line, double click in here, two meters. I'm going to repeat the process that I've just done, come across, make, making sure all the lines are dark green as I'm drawing them. If you've not got a parallel line, it's going to cause you issues when you try and develop your model further. So now I'm going to highlight these, Control and C, Control and V, highlight everything, move it into position, make sure everything's connected before I release, copy the lines again, Control and C, Control and V, move those into position, and then one more time, highlight the lines I need, Control and C, Control and V, and move that into position. Perfect. So now, apart from the near the ridge line where I drew, um, I've got two meter sections all across the board. So this one doesn't look quite right. I've got 2.03 and I've got 2.01. I'm not particularly concerned about that personally. Um, however, you take the time to go back. I think it's the case that these aren't quite straight. So if I click on these lines, they're all parallel. They're all parallel. That's fine. Why are these lines dark green? So designer is trying to tell me something here. So it's showing me that I've not connected this polygon. So I've gone too fast and the same here. These polygons are not quite connected. So in actual fact, I am bothered about that. So let's delete these lines. Just hitting it, press delete. Again, you can select multiple lines and then delete. Sorry to make you watch the process again. Let's control and C, control and V. This is partly why I like to ensure my model is nice and square because I'd have noticed that straight away but where I'm dragging lines onto a model that's not quite square that's what's caused the issue there so let's drag that up make sure that's connected this time both ends perfect control and v same again connected lovely one more time control and v move that up into position so now I've got two meter sections everywhere, apart from where I've drawn the ridge line, but we're talking about 0.6 of a mil. So that, that part I'm definitely not bothered about. And I've got no light green lines. So you saw how designer there was actually giving me a nudge. Something's not right with your model because it was light green. So dark green lines are good. Angles are good. Light green indicates that there's something not quite right with the model. So it's handy that it gives you that indication. Okay, um, now we can get rid of all of these upright lines. They were just guides. To do that, I'm just going to hold control. So that's all the lines I want to delete very gently because if you click one and stop, start to move it, it will twist the whole model. Right, they're all gone. You can see everything's the same length. Click one line, all dark green. Click a line over here, all dark green. And again, you hit the control and A, and you can see that all the lines are at perfect right angles. This is a good start. Now we can go back to satellite view and into 3D. Now this is where it's quite subjective on how you achieve your curve. I like to be at the end of the building. Um, I'm gonna double click a polygon, highlight everything and bring, bring the building up to five meters as a start point. Now, because you've drawn all of these sections, you can slowly start to manipulate each polygon to achieve your curve. And you can take as long or as short as you like. And the more you do it, the easier it will get for you. And you can start to see a curve is forming. You may not get it perfect straight away. Um, so you can take the time to manipulate each line very slowly. Um, and then from there, you probably want to give some minor adjustments. So let's start here. Move this one up a little bit more. And a little bit more. Sometimes it will snap to a new position. So you need to just give it some micro adjustments. Um, let's bring that up a little bit. Bring that a couple. And it is really all about how much time you want to spend on it. Nine times out of 10, 
you don't necessarily have to model the curve. You can just do a dual pitch tilted roof um, to find out what's going to fit on the roof. Um, however, if you want to spend the time on it, you can achieve some fairly good results. Um, so that was probably too high still because we're coming to the middle now. So where we've got a curve forming, we don't want to keep going up. Now we're coming to the middle, which is this section here. So we now want to bring the curve back down. So rather than 7.22, which is a bit high, what we hear 6.94. No, um, actually, this is the middle. So let's go up a little bit more, sorry. Uh, 7.28. Yeah, that looks good. Um, and then the last one, let's just bring that down a little bit. So this is a position now where I try and bring it down ever so slightly and it's snapping down. So it won't let me make those minor adjustments. So just use this feature up here, give it a minor adjustment. And for now, I'm quite happy with that. So what you could do is you could start now pulling up this side. But rather than that, let's be smart about it. Let's just mirror polygons on this side. And logically, we should achieve the curve. So we've got 5.59. 5.59. We've got 6.07. 6.07. 6.94. Also, must apologise for the sound of my voice this week. I know Richard Phil is used to talking phenomenal amounts. Um, I'm not, um, and the three days at the show have absolutely annihilated my voice. You did. You um, did the wrong one on 6.94. I know. Um, so if, if you make a mistake, you need to count your polygons. So I've got one, two, three, four. It doesn't quite look right on this fourth one. So one, two, three, four, six point five five. So we need to change that down. And we know the next one is six point nine four. And then lastly, seven point four three. 7.28 that's where we want to be with this one and with a bit of luck yeah we've achieved a nice curve now in order to check the curve itself if you jump into pv module placement you'll notice in site modeling you've got all the polygons and the lines look quite thick and clunky when you move into module placement you have no polygons and the lines are much smoother so you can double check what you're seeing now i'm quite happy with that you could make some further minor adjustments here because it looks a little bit angularly, um, but overall I'm quite happy with the result there. Um, again, at both ends. And there was no splitting of lines there. I didn't have to split anything. I've literally just manipulated each polygon into a position where it's formed a curve. And as I say, reference back to your Google Earth drawing or your site visit, if it needs to become shallower, just drag these polygons down until you achieve the type of curve you want, but don't drag both sides. Do one side, get the curve right, and just mirror the polygons both edges. So essentially, this building is now ready for modules. However, we mentioned the trees along the side. So if I hit the irradiance feature now, we're just gonna see bright yellow on the southerly side, 92 degrees, 91, 91, 91, 92. And then as we go on the north side, naturally the irradiance is reduced. So if we now add some trees along here into site modeling, this is done in 2D. So we've got a series of trees around here. But what I'm going to do for now, and I'll all will become clear later, is I'm going to add this hedge section. I'm going to jump into 3D. And I'm just going to drop that to the ground. And we're going to forget that's there. I'm going to jump back into 2D. And I'm going to use the new trees feature. The trees, the trees are here. Don't know if you've used the feature yet. Um, how you're finding it, how you're getting on with it. Do give us some feedback. I'm essentially clicking once and dragging to the diameter of the tree. Now I'm going to plot a few trees along here. Um, and we'll look at some different types of tree. Um, how they model, how they look. Um, I'm not going to do super amounts, but I will do a few. Um, we'll leave it at that, for example. Now, when I jump into 3D, the trees are here. But there's different options with the trees. So we can click on a tree, you get the polygon. Straight off here, you've got two types of tree. So let's go 
for this Christmas tree. Um, and you can simply click the polygon and bring the height of that tree up. But then you've got further options along here and I'll just hover over each one. You've got the tree diameter, you've got the tree trunk diameter, you've got the tree height, and you've got the tree trunk height. So the tree diameter naturally is the breadth of the tree or width of the tree. Um, let's make that nice and pretty, like a Christmas tree. Uh, let's bring the height up ever so slightly. Tree trunk diameter, let's give it a thicker trunk. Like so. Um, then we've got tree height. Um, let's raise the height up ever so slightly, which is the same thing as dragging this polygon. Um, then we've got tree trunk height. So you can make this uh, low to the ground tree with no trunk or a high to the ground sort of flying saucer type affair. Um, so let's keep that there. You can then move on to the next tree just by clicking it. Again, I'm going to drag the height up. I'm going to change the tree diameter, uh, make this big bushy tree. Like so I'm going to leave that one as it is. I'm then going to move to the next tree. Um, let's bring the height up. Um, let's reduce the diameter so it's a really thin tree. Uh, it's a different type of tree again. Move to the next one. Um, and again, I know these aren't the real trees we saw in the street image, but they're just to show you the different types of tree you can model. Um, let's have another one of these Christmas trees. Let's bring the height right up on that one. Uh, let's change the tree trunk height to that. Again, just a different type of tree. Um, artistic license on the trees today. Let's have a really thick trunk there. Uh, bring that tree up. Ooh, bring that tree up. Different looking tree again. And now lastly, let's leave it at that height. Um, so have hardly any trunk. Leave the height, tree trunk height. Let's bring that up. But right. okay, we'll leave that there. So we can see <laughs> as I uh, pan along the building, we've got several different types of tree here. So you know, whatever you're finding on site, whether it's domestic or commercial, you can model the type of tree. You might need to put invest a bit of time, but ultimately it's making your model or simulation more accurate, um, more aesthetically pleasing for your client, particularly residential, if you've modeled the trees in, um, other companies may not have done that or have, have the um, have the facility to do that. So now, when we jump back into PV module placement and just click any of these sections, we can see that the irradiance, if I go to entire site, we can see the direct effects of the trees. Indeed, this, this is actually touching the roof, so I'll re we'll remove that in a second. And even here, it doesn't necessarily look like it's affected anything, but re remember, we were at 92% on this elevation. All of a sudden, I'm seeing 88, 87, 86, 85, 84, all the way down to where that tree actually is, 73% there. And if we go to this beast, down at the bottom, 7%. So you can see whatever you add, you can actually see, that's nice that is, you can actually see the, the slight change in color as you go up the roof there, more evident here and here also. Um, so I'm just gonna go back and change this one. Um, it's a bit offensive to be fair, it's a bit unnecessary that tree. Um, so let's change this here. Let's reduce the diameter of the tree, uh, which is the first one. That should have moved it away from the roof now. Yeah, okay, so now when I go back into module placement, waiting for the irradiance feature, yeah, perfect. So you can see it's got a slight effect here, rippling out until we get far up, far enough up the roof that these trees aren't an issue. This is actually visualized really nice. I'm glad Richard suggested I do different types of trees actually, because you can see just these nice spores of darker color, um, which is essentially the shade. So previously I added the hedgerow. Um, what I'm gonna do now is something that's never gonna happen. Um, however, it should visualize quite well. So I'm gonna double click the hedgerow. And I'm actually just gonna be ridiculous and say there's a building next to our building. Now, when I jump back into PV module placement, wait for the irradiance to generate. You can see a lot of people have asked us to demonstrate how we can simulate shading. 
and this is the demonstration. Essentially, we've got a massive building, or oh, not massive, a taller building than our building in front. And you can see the effects it's had on the shade to the point where you would very much not put PV, certainly on these lower sections. The irradiance is beneath 50%. It's, it's too far gone to actually make it economically viable, in my opinion, and hopefully most people within the industry's opinion. You could argue at the top of the roof here, you'd look to start to put modules. But in essence, very unlikely you're ever going to get a building that close that's much taller. So we'll drop that back down. It was just for visualisation. OK, uh, let's add some modules. Um, so in all these sections we've created, we now need to add a module. So once we've added one section, we can quite quickly copy and paste it across. So let's make sure we use the module that we took the dimensions of, because that would be bad news if we didn't. Um, we're keeping all this. This is fine. Let's add them in portrait, um, column spacing and row spacing, two centimetres. Let's drop back out. Um, now let's add our modules. And to do that, as always, we just click and drag across. All the way across. Um, let's leave one off the end off there. And let's leave, how many have we got? Uh, 84. Let's leave one off the end here as well. So I'll press that blue button instead of the module there, which is why it's made the view go skew if. And then click and click again just to remove the module in the end, just so we know we're a metre within. I'm not going to measure it, but um, essentially we, sh we should be easily more than a metre there. And I'm just going to change that into the centre. Then we're going to click the array once, make sure they're aligned, hit Control and C. Then I'm going to click in this section, align to the bottom, scroll in and Control and V. Again, just going to line it up quickly to the middle. Um, you'd be dragging guidelines across here and ensuring they're all in line, but just for speed, I won't, I won't do that. Um, we'll just add these modules on the south face. Again, Control and V, somewhere in the middle. It will always plot to the middle of where you're hovering your cursor. So leave those there. A couple more times and we're good. So because we created those sections, we have to click into each individual section in order to paste or add modules for that matter. Uh, looks roughly there. A uh, couple more. And the smaller you make these sections, the more defined or the greater ability you will have to achieve the curve. But firstly, you have to be able to fit a module in. So there's no point doing a 1.5 meter section unless you're putting the modules landscape, which on some curves is actually advisable because it becomes easier to manage the curve of a module and the mounting system. Um, however, on these shallow type curves, you can do portrait installs. Um, let's just line this one up and I think we'll leave that there. Good, um, and go to entire site. And straight away, we can see that's visualizing really nicely. Um, so we've got all our, all our modules added on there. Sorry, excuse me, I just need a quick drink. Apologies for that. My throat is particularly sore. Um, okay, so quite quickly, I'm not sure how long that was, but quite quickly, uh, we've got 498 modules, a curved roof modelled, several trees, irradiance modelled, just under 170 kilowatt in probably half an hour. Um, so, yep. Uh, questions come up about the height of trees. Is there any kind yes. of idea or indication that we could uh, uh, understand the height of trees? Um, if we've not been to site or if, if we kind of, I mean, if we've been to site, then obviously we understand the height of trees. We can gauge the mm -hmm. height of trees. Um, mm -hmm. Can you just show the Google uh, on projects info? Yeah. Um, so ultimately, um, if you've not been to site, the best thing to do is have a conversation with the client. Um, although sometimes it's not possible. Um, for example, the building owner may not be the building occupier. So I understand that's not always possible. But where you can try and have a conversation, they'll be able to tell you, oh yeah, they're level with the building, or oh yeah, they're roughly one, two meters above the roof line. But this Google Earth um, Street View feature does give you an indication, but do remember trees grow. Yeah. Um, it's just one of the things of the world is kind of what they do. Um, 
So we can't quite see it here because this question mark's covering it, but this would have given me the date of the image. If you went to Google Earth itself, you'd be able to see the date. Um, so this would give me an indication as to when the image was taken. And, and we can see here, if for example, I've said that's a five metre building, in actual fact, it probably looks a little bit taller. I can see the, the top of the tree is here. So the tree is possibly a, a meter or half a metre higher. Um, if anyone knows the typical height of a street lamp, you could use that as scale, um, but just try and use some surroundings around you um, to work out the height of the tree. It is best guess, but ultimately it's better to, to model it with best guess than not model it at all, because you're gauging your, your end client's um, interest um, in the PV system itself. So if they're interested after you've done this modeling, that's when you commit perhaps and, and do a site visit and be able to gain more information on the trees. And also exactly as you've said, Chris, I mean, if that photograph was taken back in 2019 or 2020, then those trees are higher now as well. So, you know, you kind of want to gauge what you're going to be looking at in five, six, eight, 10, 15 years time with yeah. tree modeling, because when those trees we... grow, it's but going to affect the performance of the system and the expectation of the client is it's going to generate this much power and you know this feedback and, and in, in 10 years time when it's not you know it's you've taken that into consideration for the shading already yeah and there is the other side of the coin to that as well you know a lot of these types of developments will have tree maintenance plans so they may have it in place that they're not allowed to let the trees go x amount above the roof line they may not but tree maintenance plans are a thing uh, and it comes down to engaging with the end client. And if, if the end client is the building owner, they should know about the tree management plans, et cetera. Now, I'm not saying that's the, the case in every scenario, but just ask some questions, use best guess, model it as best you can, gauge the client's interest and get yourself to site where possible. Um, short of that, I can't really tell you um, how to guess the height of a tree other than using the surrounding areas. You got on an articulated lorry there, uh, it's probably three and a half meters from the ground or not sure of the height but for example if you knew the height of an articulated lorry you see that these trees are fairly level with it um but again it's it's best guess um that that's the the best advice i can give really um, let's come out of there um uh, where were we pv module placement um, a couple of other questions as well um chris while you're there as well um can you place the modules over the lines um no you can't Basically, when Chris was starting the design in 2D, that's why he took that two meter distance. If he moves these modules just above this line, as you'll see now, they go red. You can't do it. So this is why you need to have that space in the first section. If you had two meter gaps like he's done, and then you did them as two two rows of uh, of landscape, for example, then mm. obviously you're going to be there. But because you've put different uh, ridge lines, essentially, that's what they are, multiple lines, that's basically giving you the angle at that point. So the angle on this particular roof that he's on at the moment, maybe say 15 degrees at the bottom, then the next session up is say 14, then 13, then 12, up to the top where it's, it's flat. Um, so the different angles were on there. So you can't put them over the lines because you've got different facets. Um, you can put them very close to the line, in fact, on the line, but as soon as it goes red, see I'm over the line there. As soon as it goes red, you can't. So I think it's roughly halfway in the line. Yeah. But you can bring them there. You could then bring this section down a little bit. Um, Cause I know that there are gaps in here. Um, previously, um, when I've done Kerr's routes, I've made much smaller sections, but it takes a lot longer to then develop. And I didn't want that to happen on the webinar, essentially. I didn't want to spend 20 minutes moving polygons. Sure. But you yeah. can okay. do smaller sections, marry them up closer, and then your modules will look much closer on the roof by yeah. such. And then another question as well, um, take it we'd normally make the first spacing one meter for a commercial design. Yes, so yes. I mean there is yeah. there is the thing that we've, we've covered before with the guidelines, when you yeah. uh, are actually in PV module placement, uh, you can actually hover your mouse over an external uh, uh, line and then just drag it in and it gives you a guideline. So if Chris just shows you there at the bottom, he's moved his mouse over the bottom blue line and he can then just release up a guideline. So as many guidelines as you want. So just, just for access to speed, we've not shown the guidelines because we showed those in previous ones. Yeah. And another question as well is, um, can you string the modules virtually over the roof? Um, sorry, virtually. Can you string the modules vertically over the roof? You can, but I wouldn't advise it. Um, the reason why I wouldn't advise it is because um, you, you've got different angles. 
Um, yeah. So if you if you're using single optimizers, then yes, no problem. Um, because you're making every panel work as, a, as an individual. When you're talking about commercial, that bottom row, as I just mentioned, may be at 15 degrees, but the next one up may only be at 13 degrees. So because yeah. you've got those two strung on the same power optimizer, it's always going to be working to the least performing panel out of those two. So on a curved roof, you can mitigate it um, by obviously using power optimizers if you were, if you had to string them vertically. Um, but yeah, I hope that understands. Yeah, essentially with this type of roof, you want all the modules on one facet in the same strings. You don't want to start sharing strings because of the tilts and whatnot. Um, you will get a warning, a warning message on designer if you do that and it's going to adversely affect your design. It will tell you, uh, it will give you an amber exclamation mark, I think. Um, yeah. And it will tell you, you should review it. And there are actually some, some help tips and tricks um, in the help section here um, of, of how to mitigate that. Um, another question is coming as well. Is there a standard distance to leave between the rows for maintenance? Um, I, if you're in the mid, if, 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 if something goes wrong in the middle, how would you actually get to it? This mm -hmm. comes down to, to you, to, to be honest with you, completely down to you. Um, there is some guidance from the MTS. Uh, they've got a uh, operations and maintenance guidance. So when it comes down to installing modules, um, rather than filling a complete roof with modules, you know, give yourself walkways, give yourself access. You know, you're installing something for 20 years. You know, perhaps you've, you, do, you do have a failure, perhaps you have a, an issue, a isolation resistance issue, stringing issue, vermin, anything like that. You're quite right, Ian. How are you going to get to it? So personally, what I would always do, and when I was uh, an installer as well, working on commercial systems, I would never go more than four modules in height um, mm. without a space. And I would, I would likely do them in banks of, say, eight wide. So then you're just... You're, you don't want to give too many uh, maintenance areas because then you're minimizing the roof space that you're using, but you don't want to give yourself too few because then if there is a, a potential issue or cleaning or anything in the future, um, then you, you obviously want to give yourself some maintenance access. So carport, Chris. Ooh, carport, okay. Site modeling. Um, okay, in order to model a carport, we need a car park. Let's use this one. Um, okay, carports are super quick in designer, really nice, really effective, really easy, all the reallys. Um, let's jump into 2D. Um, I've just spun around once, let's do that again. Um, right, first of all, we need to complete a plane or an aspect. So we're going to draw a box around this section of the car park here. Still going to keep it at right angles just because it's the type of guy I am. But it doesn't essentially have to be at right angles this section. But when you're aligning modules to an edge, it definitely helps. So let's just tighten this up a little bit. So once I've drawn the lines, you can pull and, and move them about and they'll stay locked at right angles. That's fine. And that's fine. Okay, that's all the modeling we need to do. Apart from any new aspect you add within designer will be at three meters. So we just need to double click that, drop that to the ground. That's all the modeling done. We're ready now for modules. Um, let's just stick with the same module for simplicity. Um, let's turn off the irradiant so we can see the car parking spaces and let's align to this edge to begin with. And let's get closer to the action. Okay, module. Um, I'll stick with the same module, but let's say it's black this time. Um, okay, so there are different carports, there are different structures, there are different configurations. Um, a lot of them, though, are tilted at five degrees um, with a frame size of three high in portrait, and most likely three meters from the ground. As I've said, other configurations are available. I'm not saying this is how all carports are done, um, but a large amount that we see have been like this. So you set your parameters. Now all you need to do is simply click once, drag across and cover the area you want to cover with the modules, drag them into position so they're covering the car parking spaces, job done. Click here, let's align these modules, add module, it's saved the parameters that I've used. So once again, five degrees tilt, frame size of three high in portrait at a height of three meters from the ground. Then 
simply going to click and drag. Um, you could choose to go all the way across, but I'm just going to observe the car parking spaces and finish it there. Uh, let's drag this down a section there. And while I've got modules facing this direction, I'm also going to add these other sections here. So I'm going to add modules, just drag this section across, put it into position and leave that there. I'm going to do the same here. I'm just going to select the array, Control and C, Control and V. And like we saw before, it's over the line, so the module's red. So I can just grab the array and move that into position using the center line of the car park as a guide. Just drag those into position there. And then we can switch to this view. So we're now aligning modules facing down. Same parameters. Drag that into position. Uh, and this side of the car park is actually longer. So let's just bring that over there. Same here, let's click once, add our bank of modules. Just drag that in line. Roughly, I'm not going to worry too much. And then once more, we can click the array, hold Control C, Control V, drag that into position. Good. And that is our carport modeled. Amazing. So you've got the gull wing effect. And the way to get the goal wing effect is follow what I've just done and align the modules to the opposite side. So ordinarily, if this was a building with a not an inverted pitch, but a duo pitch, a normal pitch roof, you'd have aligned the modules to this edge, this edge here. But because we want goal wings, you go the opposite side and you've got a really nice effect there. Quite quickly built, all at the same height. Indeed, you can go underneath the carport, through it, round it, take whatever pictures you want on your summary and report screen. So there is a and curved then, roof and a carport. So yeah, curved roof and carport. And it's it, it, the, the one thing as well, which uh, which I would mention because I've done this a couple of uh, years ago, is as I showed at the very beginning, if Chris now goes to do the stringing, it will take oh. the complete system together into the actual inverter selection. So you don't want to do that. If you're doing a curved roof first, do the curved roof, go to the inverter selection, choose your inverters, and then away you go. Go back to the PV modules and then add the carport in there. Again, if you're doing the carport, I think generally speaking, what I would want to do as an installer is actually have an inverter per table. So yeah. perhaps the two goal wings, I would draw those uh, those first, the east, the east, yeah, exactly, those two there, then do the inverter selection, then do the next one, inverter selection, next one, and then from that, you're then basically making it easier for the installation. Well, of course, if you're going to have one central place, whether you're going to have one inverter and you're going to run the DC cables everywhere, no problem. So, but that's, that's just a tip, um, I would say. So, fantastic. It looks like uh, some... <laughs> Like something in a cocktail. <laughs> uh, fantastic. Um, great, wonderful, Chris. Thanks very much. A couple of questions that we've got as well. Some of the questions early on as well. Um, one of these is um, uh, where was it here? Can you mix single and dual optimizers in one string? No, you can't. You can mix single and dual optimizers on an inverter, but if you've got, say, the P850s, uh, and then you needed to do uh, the single optimizers, they have to be separate strings. If you've got an odd number of optimizers, sorry, an odd number of modules, say, for example, you've got 31 modules, um, you would then be using 16 power optimizers, 16 of the duals, so 16 P850s, for example. You would then have 15 two to one, and then the final one, you would just have the one optimizer connected to that one uh, that one module. So you'd have 16 in total. The reason for that is because the firmware is different and it's it, the voltages are different of the actual uh, dual optimizers compared to the singles. So if you're doing dual optimizers, you have to use dual optimizers full stop across that if it's in the same string. The previous one I showed very at the beginning, I had a mixture of strings. So I had a single string of single optimizers and then a single string of, uh, of dual optimizers in there as well. So that was that. Um, this one as well was, there was another question in here as well about the pricing of the, um, of the financials. Um, 
the, the one thing I would say more about the financials is play with it. Have a little go. If there's any questions that you've got about anything to do with the financials, just in the help section in the bottom right hand corner of the whole screen that Chris is showing, there's a question mark. If you click on the question mark and then at the top where it then gives you the option, you can then just type in financial. And it shows you just there how to do, do the financial analysis. So the help section is really nice. It goes through, opens up a nice little um, um, application note, which shows you exactly how to do all of the different financials. So that's that's all in there as well. Uh, there was another question in here earlier that came through. Uh, really good trees, really like it. Joined late, will I get recording? Yes, got recording. Height of the trees, which was over the lines. No, it was before that. There was a question before that. That was a good one. Uh, where was it? Black, sketchy, can the lines in the view black? Thanks, if you remove something for the summary, how'd you get it back? No, we did that one. Um, does the logo be inserted for each project? That was answered as well. Um, each design, I know you're different modules, different profiles. Ah, oh, that was it, okay, great. So it's a different profile. So say for example, you've got um, a customer there and you've, the question, the question that's been written is, um, each design, I know you can add different PV modules and different layouts, um, but can you also look at different profiles? So if, for example, you've got a client and you've got a profile for one of the actual sites and you know what, what they're using and, and perhaps you've, you've got the data, the half hourly data, can you do different profiles? So one's five days a week and perhaps one seven days a week. So almost like if they're going to increase their production in the future, because they're going to start opening up on a Saturday, how can I model the two together? So one, this is what you're currently doing five days a week, but actually if you move to six days a week, can you model different profiles in the same design? In the same design, you can't do it, but what you can do on the very beginning of the whole project in the top left-hand corner where you've got the project, as Chris is showing now, you can also duplicate the whole design in there as well. So then you can then have two different designs, one with the new uh, consumption profiles and one with the existing consumption profiles. So there's a couple of things on that on that main page in there as well. So and once that. you've clicked that duplicate, it will work. Just give it a minute. It's the yeah. best advice I can give because you'll click it and nothing will happen. And there it is. So that was a good like 30 seconds, 40 seconds maybe. Um, but some of us are impatient. It will work. Just bear with it, and then you can name it anything you want. So that's that's that. So, um, and and that's it for questions actually today. So there's not that many questions that have come through. So if anyone's got any further questions in there, um, then please please come through. There was one question that I just wanted to bring up um, from. It was actually last week's um, uh, uh, presentation, and it was about the flat roof design. Um, and it was about the shading impact that came up because someone asked me afterwards about the shading impact and the colors on the actual screen. Do they actually show what the performance is like? In the summary page um, of, of that particular design, at the very bottom where you've got the system loss diagram, what it will actually show you is the shading impact. And that shading impact is over a year. So what the shading impact is, it, it will actually show you like a minus 5% or a minus 7%. And, and the person, the installer was actually saying to me, I was expecting it to be less, um, sorry, sorry, more. So as in there's more, more, more impact of the shading. You can't see anything on there because you haven't done the stringing. Yeah, um, I didn't have the, the diagram yeah. next to the pin with nothing on it, but, but no. But basically in, in the winter months, there's obviously going to be less light. So in the winter months, there will be more shading and impact. And perhaps, you know, on a winter month, 50% shading should be seen. But the problem is what designer does, it works out the total generation of the whole year and it works out the shading loss for every 12 months of that period and adds that all up together and then comes out with that 5% shading. Obviously in the summer months, there's going to be very limited shading on the system like that because the sun's much higher in the sky. So it works it out from the total generation from the whole year and then works that shading pattern out. So cool. that's it. Chris, thanks very much. Everyone, thanks Welcome. very much for attending once again. Um, we're doing an updates in designer. Um, I believe we're going to be start doing them once every three months because there's new features coming up. So there's a couple of features in here which questions have come up which I've ignored about the DXF files and things like that. So we're going to actually be showing the DXF files because they're relatively new to designer anyway. So um, thanks, Andy. Thanks very much. Thanks for all of you for attending. Um, and as ever, there's a short survey just coming up afterwards. Appreciate your feedback and see you all again soon. Thanks very much. Thank you all. Everything, Chris. Amazing. Cheers, bud. Thank you. Bye. Bye.